Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to Talking with Traders. This is the fifth season of the podcast to take us up to the end of 2022. Thanks to all our loyal listeners for returning and welcome to all our new listeners. As before, IG Markets have come on board as sponsors of this podcast. We're truly grateful to have such an award-winning CFD provider as sponsor alongside us. In this season, I'll welcome back some guests from the previous seasons of the podcast to get their updated market views, and we'll also be bringing in some new guests to the microphone too. As always, the aim with these podcasts is to give you the opportunity to listen to differing market views and to assist you with your own trading and investing education. So with that in mind, let's get straight into another episode of Talking with Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking with Traders, and this time I'm delighted to head westwards. We're going to the United States of America, and we're going to Kansas City, where we've got Austin Harrison on the line. Uh, Austin is uh, the representative of MeansToAtrend.com. That's where you can follow his work. And uh, I came across you, Austin, on the Daily Chart Report, which is a free email that I get, and I know thousands of other people also receive it. And on that email, there's always some fairly interesting insights from a number of independent contributors, one of whom is yourself. And I always found myself clicking on the links to your articles and going and reading the blog articles that you that you write each week, because they're always quite punchy and quite insightful. And that's where I found you um, and obviously looked you up, wanted to do a podcast with you. And here we are talking. It's uh, 6 a.m. your time in Kansas City. (laughs) It's 11 a.m. for me here in London. Nice and early morning start there for you, but I know that you are an early riser, as you said to me. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. And, you know, I agree. Chart Report is is just a fantastic email. Um, If it's not something that that you're subscribed to, um, you know, definitely check it out uh, for those listeners because, yeah. Patrick puts together, you know, great curated list of, of, you know, charts and articles every single day, um, you know, keeps you from having to, to do that work yourself. But yeah, I mean, thanks for having me on, um, you know, what you've done with this podcast, really impressive. And, you know, for people that haven't created this content before, you know, it's really grind and, and being able to do this consistently and, you know, have these in-depth conversations with, uh, you know, just a ton of great information for traders um you know just really impressive and and honored to be on here super well well thank you i'm really looking forward to chatting to you uh as as i always do with every one of these podcasts austin is when i get a new guest on i like to just build the background a little bit about that guest because you know often we'll have the same guest on later on and perhaps in a year's time or whatever um so in keeping with that theme what i'd like to do is just get a little bit of background to yourself you're you look a lot younger than I am, and uh, clearly very ambitious. But just give us a bit of insight into your background, how you got involved in the markets, and the path that your career has followed to this point. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, the interest started, you know, very young, like it does for a lot of people. Um, you know, for me, if I was going to try and pinpoint that one moment, um, you know, I was probably nine or ten, um, you know, in a math class and. Yeah, I had a teacher that that introduced us all to the stock market and, you know, as part of a project, um, you know, had us pick stocks and gave us, you know, maybe it was like a $10,000 model portfolio and, you know, learn how to calculate share counts and and profits and losses and, you know, really simple stuff, but, you know, it was nine or 10. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, just coming in probably every Friday and, and reading tickers off the back of the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, I just thought that was that was the coolest thing ever. Um, so from then on, I always had that interest. Uh, but, you know, it took me a long time to get in because um, I really just didn't know how the industry worked. Had no exposure to it when I was younger. Uh, you know, my parents uh, basically put everything that they had into, into their business and didn't have a financial advisor, didn't really have retirement savings. So I just didn't have an understanding of how it worked. Um, 
you know, their parents were the same way. My mom's parents were farmers and really, you know, low, no liquid assets. And my dad's family was, was super poor. Um, didn't even have running water for a lot of his childhood. Oh. So, you know, obviously they didn't have any exposure to it either. Um, so, you know, really didn't get involved until after college. And then, you know, after college got started here at uh, a wealth management firm here in Kansas city, um, you know, couldn't have asked for a better place to, to get started and uh, to end up, you know, I've had great mentors and just really smart people to work with um, and learn from. And, you know, they brought me on as, as uh, you know, someone on the accounting side that primarily worked with you know, performance reporting and, uh, you know, portfolio management accounting system. Um, and then that slowly evolved into, into more of an analyst position. And, uh, you know, now I work primarily as, as an investment strategist and, and equity analyst and uh, started, like you said, writing on, on means to a trend about three and a half years ago. And so, yeah, that's, that's how I got here. Yeah. Excellent. I can also see from your bio that you've, you've studied very hard. Um, it's, you've got an impressive CV. I mean, you, you've got degrees in accounts and in finance, but you also have CFA and CMT designations behind your name. And I can actually see the CFA certificate on the wall behind you there <laughs> in, in your office. Um, obviously, that is something to be incredibly proud of. I mean, I, I tried out for it and I failed in the first year trying for CFA. To be fair, I didn't study very hard and I was busy <laughs> with working and other commitments. So, you know, I can make all kinds of excuses. But the point is, I know how difficult it is to achieve that CFA designation. But What's quite interesting about yourself is that you have both that CFA as well as the CMT. Now, for for listeners of this podcast who maybe don't know, CFA, uh, Chartered Financial Analyst, and CMT, Certified Markets Technician. So the CFA designation comes at it very much from a fundamental analyst perspective, uh, looking at things like cash flows and dividend yields and valuations and forward growth rates and all of that type of thing. CMT, on the other hand, is a very, it's a technical analysis designation, looking at the trends, looking at, you know, how to read charts and all of that. Now, what's interesting in my career, I've always found that there are sort of two schools of people and and they don't often uh, blend into one. Maybe it's more that more so these days, but certainly looking back historically, you were either in the fundamental camp or you were in the technical analysis camp and, you know, and 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 for a for a long period of time, I think the technical analysis guys were viewed as these sort of guys that read the tea leaves and a little bit crazy and a little bit out on 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 the edge, you know. <laughs> so to find someone that's put both of those qualifications together is quite rare. Although I'll say it's rare, but there are more guys that I'm re realizing starting to do both of them. And I think technical analysis is becoming more and more accepted as a as a respected way of reading markets. It's not all just about fundamentals. And certainly in my own trading, I find, I mean, I'm more of a, I have more of a technical analysis bent and we can talk about why that is the case later. But from your perspective, I mean, you've done both of these qualifications and from what I can understand, you actually completed them both at the same time. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, even more impressive because I know that they're both a lot of work. So to, <laughs> to complete both of those at exactly the same time con concurrently is uh, is good going. But tell us yeah. a little bit about each of them. I mean, th there's pros and cons to each, right? And and I'm thinking of it from the perspective of younger listeners to this podcast who may be starting out their career and wanting to know what to study. And I, it's a question I get asked often. You know, what what should I study? I want to get into markets. What do you recommend that I study? From your perspective, having done both of these qualifications, which are both, in in my opinion, are you know creme de la creme in terms of market qualifications. You know, if you had to lean one way or the other, which would you advise a youngster to go to? Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, and one I get pretty frequently because, you know, it is really important to these younger, younger investors. Um, you know, as far as leaning one way or the other, um, you know, in my opinion, it really just depends on on what you want to do with your career. Um you know, the CFA is, is I think, the gold standard um, when it comes to really just any job in, in finance. Um, it's just so broad, gives you the groundwork in, in a ton of different areas. Um, 
you know, if you have a CFA behind your name, that's going to get your foot in the door pretty much anywhere. Um, you know, with the CMT, uh, maybe, like you said, not as much recognition um, from, from other people in the industry. And, you know, that's not going to help you out in corporate finance. But, you know, if you're, you're a portfolio manager, if you're a trader, you know, that CMT is, is really going to be more targeted towards you. Mm, so, mm. Um, so if, if you had to pick one, you know, I think the CFA is, is probably the way to go. Um, you know, it's a lot harder. I'll, I'll give it that. Like you said, um, you know, I, I don't blame you for, for failing out in that first year because it's hard. It's a grind. Um, you know, I gave up a lot of weekends, a lot of nights, um, missed out on time with, with friends and family, um, had an angry wife a lot of the time, <laughs> um, you know, missed, missed some of those early months with my, my first daughter there. And, you know, obviously regret some of those missing some of those things, but, you know, it's, it's turned out to, to be okay for me. Um, like you said, I got got both the CFA and CMT done at, at about the same time, got them done as quickly as I, as I could, um, you know, started the CFA straight out of college, you know, with, with my background in college, like you said, those finance and accounting degrees, um, took a ton of economics coursework as well. There's just a lot of curriculum overlap. Um, so that CFA route made sense, uh, for continuing my education and, you know, I definitely did not want to go out and, and get an MBA because I hate school, <laughs> like learning, but hate school. So, um, you know, those designations are are really more my speed. So, um, you know, went out and got the CFA pretty much right away. Um, had a failure in there myself, too, with, with level two, um, yeah. but still uh, got it done pretty quickly. And like I said, the CMT started doing that um about halfway through my CFA program you know the CFA program is you know four years of work experience um so it's a pretty extended process and you know like I said completed the CMT there there at the end of it and yeah just glad to have them out of the way and and uh able to to do other things with my life now yeah able to able to put it all to use in the work that you do yeah so that's what we're going to talk about now the work that you do and getting into the the meat of the conversation a little bit more now talking a little bit more about current market environment um your most recent blog article that you published what was what is the last week final week of uh of october now yeah, uh, as I said, all of your blogs are very punchy and very interesting and very short to read, which is also something I appreciate. It's nice to get the information <laughs> across there quickly, which you do. Um, you spoke about bullish divergences, and you were referring specifically to the financials sector and the tech sectors in in the US. Now, obviously, those are big sectors. The the tech sector biggest by weighting right. in the S and P five hundred. Um, so you know. I guess for the uninitiated, let's talk about this, uh, the, the bullish divergence. What does that mean? And how do we interpret it in terms of the current market environment where we are right now, heading into the end of the year? Yeah. Yeah. So when, when we're talking about bullish divergences, um, specifically for for momentum is what I was looking at um, in that blog post. So what we're looking at there is when you know, price is doing one thing and momentum um, as measured by a 14 period RSI is doing something different. So, you know, right now stocks are, are clearly in a downtrend. I don't think you would disagree with that yeah. uh, by any means, but, you know, when, uh, when tech and financials were breaking to new lows in, in October, you know, RSI, mom, RSI momentum was actually setting a higher low. Um, actually didn't even get into oversold territory. So um, when something like that happens, you know, when you get a divergence like that, it's a good idea to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's the way that I treat momentum divergences because they do pop up all over the place. Um, you know, I say that, you know, more often than not, they can lead to rallies, but those rallies are mean reversions until they've proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in this case, um, you know, you get a bullish divergence, you know, you start looking for the potential of, of mean reversion rallies, but until they've proven otherwise, we have to treat them like, 
like bear market rallies, um, you know, and that's, you know, those bear or those uh, divergences popped up in, in more than just financials and tech. Um, you know, you saw them in communications as well. Um, and in REITs, which have been two of the weakest sectors all year, um, you know, but, you know, the more, the better, but, yeah. you know, you still have to, to tr take them with a grain of salt, um, you know, because the trend is still down. Now, yeah. I mean, all that said, can't have a trend reversal without first having a mean reversion. So yes. we don't want to just completely discount these. Um, definitely want to keep an eye on and hopeful that that maybe we saw those lows in October, but um, mm. just keeping a close eye here. Yeah, and certainly we, I mean, you mentioned the lows in October. I mean, a, a lot of the stuff that I've seen, in fact, on the chart report emails um, highlights the fact that October is a month that very often sees the market make a bottom. Just, I mean, not no particular reason, but that's just a seasonal factor. Um, more market lows have been made in October than any other month of the year. And then it's quite common to get a seasonal uh, year-end rally looking out into the into the end of the year we are coming off very very oversold levels and as you said those those bullish divergences i mean the, the way i interpret a, a, a bullish divergence is effectively it's saying to you yeah the trend is down but the momentum of that move that move is slowing and for any anything to change direction it's got to first slow down in the direction that it's heading and that's kind of right. what we're saying here so and, and, and in a similar vein i mean some a filter that i do every week is i look at all the stocks in the S and P 100 that are either above or below their 50 day moving average. And it's just, I mean, I make a note of it each week. And what was quite interesting now going back a couple of weeks is to actually see how many stocks are beginning to move above their 50 day moving average, even though the index itself, the S and P 500 index was actually making fresh lows below the June low. And that's another way, I guess, of, of, of indicating that there is, some sort of underlying strength beginning to emerge at the lower levels in the market and um, and 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 you call it hidden buying if you want i suppose yeah. but it's another yeah, it's mean, another indicator that your your trend is potentially starting to turn on the broader market yeah i mean uh, agreed 100% i mean i was just going through charts yesterday and just shocked by the number of of individual issues that showing some strength um you know number of new highs out there just really impressive new 52 yeah. week highs yeah. um i think the most 52 week highs in in the s p 500 since since early this year so yeah yeah a lot of a lot of underlying strength out there for yeah sure. likewise i'm also you know when i when i actually go through the individual stocks it's quite remarkable to see just how many of them have recovered very very aggressively off the lows as you say some have made new all-time highs or new 52 week highs um and, and you kind of think, well, we're still in a bear market. And well, I guess we are, but you know, it's a market of stocks. And there right. are stocks out there that are doing very, very well, notwithstanding the fact that the broad indices are still in a downtrend. Let's talk a little bit about the bigger picture uh, macroeconomic environment, though. Um, and just in terms of where we are now and where we may be heading, uh, looking out to next year. I mean, I think we've, we're kind of in agreement that it's possible that the market's made a short term bottom now in October. The, all of the technical indicators that we both follow look as if they are starting to turn better. I'll 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 use the word bullish very cautiously because you know yes. short term bullish, uh, medium term still a bear trend, still a downtrend, and still a very long way off the highs on the on the broader indices. But I mean, from a macroeconomic standpoint, how, how if you could summarize the picture in sort of three or four minutes. How do you see it at the moment? I mean, we've got so many cross currents right now, interest rates rising, but the the possibility that the Fed maybe starts to talk down the pace of rate hike soon, um, commodity prices you know, all over the place, the dollar is still strong, but looking like it might be coming off a bit. 10-year treasury yields come back off their highs, but still fairly high. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what, <laughs> what are you seeing from a broader macroeconomic perspective and how does that kind of guide your your market view from here? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you already nailed a lot of the big points there. I mean, um, you know, just you know, in word, you know, recession seems like it's probably going to happen sometime in the next 12 months. Um, you know, that's, that's definitely the consensus view. Um, you know, you've got, 
inflation cutting into consumer spending, you know, crushing consumer confidence. Um, you're starting to see signs of slowdown in, in some of that survey data with, uh, you know, like PMI surveys. You know, housing, especially here in the U.S., has certainly weakened a lot. Um, Seven percent mortgage rate will do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you got a couple of negative quarters of GDP earlier this year. Um, obviously, got war in Eastern Europe. So I've hope COVID overhang in China, um, you know, that, that hurts activity. And then, like you said, the backdrop of, of central banks around the world, just tightening monetary policy. So just a ton of, ton of headwinds out there. Um, so it's not hard to see why, you know, consensus is for recession sometime uh, soon, you know, um, you know, I'm not an economist, but, you know, seems like that's reasonable maybe we can avoid a recession um you know but but it's it's seeming it seems unlikely given i mean look at the yield curve and that's what everybody follows right as a as a lead for the recession i mean you've got the biggest um inversion in the twos and tens yield curve uh, in it well since 2008 um so that that is like a massive red light flashing saying that a recession is coming i mean every single recession in history has been preceded preceded by by a, a, an inversion in the yield curve and we've got a massive inversion in the yield curve now so it is i think like you said it's almost a given that the market is expecting a recession yeah, yeah. but to that extent then let's think about this i mean if i look back at bear markets in the past that you get your normal sort of garden variety, vanilla bear market, and then you get the the big ones, the recessionary bear markets. Um, so the last in my career that, that, that I've been around was obviously the dot-com bubble burst. So that was in 2000 till 2003. That was quite a nasty bear market. And then the second one, of course, was the financial crisis and the, the housing bubble burst in the US. And that was 2008, 2009. When I look at market analogs, you know, and I, and I want to ask you how much you kind of rely on a market analog, or do you believe in them, or you know, what are your thoughts on it? But a market analog really is where you look back at the past, look at at a market pattern that's happened some stage in the past, and see whether there's some sort of uh, regularity to that type of pattern in a different macroeconomic environment. So. To my mind, you know, the, these recessionary bear markets are the big ones. They typically take a lot longer, they last longer, and they're deeper. You know, you're talking about an average recessionary bear market, I think it's somewhere around about minus 35% on the S&P 500. Right. And the time that it takes to play out is sort of two years, give or take, 24 months on average. Whereas your more shorter term, as I referred to them, garden variety bear market and they're they're a lot quicker and they're not as deep is it your view then that we're possibly in a in a in a recessionary bear market and that there's still more pain ahead as we look out to 2023 yeah um that is that is the trillion dollar question isn't it um it is yeah i mean definitely Definitely would seem that if we're we're going into a recession sometime next year, that you know there could be more pain ahead. Um, you know, looking at those those historical um, you know experiences, you know, the, especially the two that that you've lived through, the the dot com and and the financial crisis, those were declines of fifty percent or more. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, being down. You know, only about thirty percent so far this year for for U.S. stocks. Um, you know, the, if we were to to repeat the performances of those those last couple of recessions, then you know you definitely have more downside. But um, you know, the longer term average, uh, I think you just said is about thirty five percent. So we're we're pretty close to to that already. Um, the unusual thing I think this time around is just how early stocks peaked. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think we're in a recession right now, but stocks peaked 10 months ago. Yeah. Um, you know, stocks are always a leading indicator. We always expect them to peak before a recession starts, but you know, not by this much. Yeah. So um, you know, who's to say that maybe stocks bottom before the recession even starts? I mean, I think that would be incredibly unusual, but um, you know, there's no rule against it. No. <laughs> so 
um, you know, it's, it's historic, historical, uh, you know, analogs, they make a lot of sense. Um, I don't put a ton of weight into, you know, the, the people that overlay, you know, the peak of one, um, with another, I think some people have success doing that and, you know, it kind of falls into the same camp of, of, uh, like seasonality and, you know, we know election cycles have impacts on, on stock market returns. Um, so, you know, that, that definitely works for some people. It's not something that I do a lot of, um, but, you know, there are plenty of lessons to learn from, from previous bear markets. You know, like you said, they just take time. Um, we're only 10 months into this. You know, those last couple of big bear markets that we had took, took years, um, two years or more. So, um, yeah. you know, you, you have these big, big, long bear markets and you have huge, huge rallies in the meantime that, you know, looking back, you can't really put yourself in that place and understand what it's like to live through a 20% bear market rally. Yeah. Um, you know, imagine just being on the sidelines through that and missing out. Um, but then that end up being the right call. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's hard, it's hard to put yourself in that place. So, yeah. um, just understanding that bear markets are super volatile from day to day and even from month to month, um, is a good lesson to learn. Uh, yeah. It's it feels right now like we're you know about to experience one of those those nasty bear market rallies. Well, it's, and I say it's nasty if you're short or if you're not involved, right? It's right. and it and, and and often those end up becoming sort of FOMO rallies, fear of missing out. Where we as we sit here, the market bottomed well two weeks ago, uh, two three weeks ago. The S and P five hundred is up more than ten percent off the low already. I mean that's a quick move. Right. If you didn't you know get involved at the bottom suddenly you're you're looking and saying wow um, i'm missing out here and my sense is that you could be facing a situation in the coming months now leading out into the end of the year where you've got these seasonal tailwinds behind you and you've got yeah i think a fed that's probably not likely to talk too much more hawkish than what they already have uh yeah. you know and and you could find that all of these things kind of come together to to spread put a bit more fuel under this bear market rally and find that it actually does keep on pushing higher into the end of the year. And then, but, but I guess one needs to be careful if you are still broadly speaking for bearish in a, in a macroeconomic sense, still of the view that we've got a recession coming, you know, be very careful of, of getting too aggressively sucked into a bear market rally if it happens in the next couple of months. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that seems to make sense. Um, you know, like you said, we've got, you know, Powell speaking, you know, later this week, I think by the time this airs, he'll have already yeah. spoken. So, um, you know, he has the potential to to kind of pour gasoline on on the fire here. Yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of expectations that that he'll come out and and kind of soften the tone. Um, you know, he really hardened that tone uh, at Jackson Hole back in August, where you know we had thought that that maybe the the pace of rate hikes was at least going to level off and um, kind of changed our minds and, and now we've gotten several 75 basis point hikes in a row. Um, and we'll probably get another one this week. So, you know, if he comes out and, and says that, you know, the fed is seriously considering a pause, you know, in the early parts of next year, I and kind of confirms what the market is already sus suspecting. Um, yeah, you could have, could have a, a pretty serious rally on our hands. And, and like we talked about before, um, you know, in the initial stages of this rally, you know, we are in a downtrend, so we have to treat it like a mean reversion, but all new bull markets start with a mean reversion. So, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's very hard to, to sit on the sidelines and watch this market go up, but you know, if it, if it doesn't fit with your own personal thesis, then, um, you definitely don't want to be, um, you know, basically getting ramrodded into having a position that you don't want just because yeah. you're afraid of missing out. Sure. Uh, so it's tough, tough to navigate. Yeah. Part of the, the the backdrop for all of this is is inflation, right? And the and and the Fed's outlook on interest rates. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess that's the real root of everything that we, we we're grappling with here at the moment is the fact that inflation's spiked. Um, it's probably peaking round about now. I think it's may maybe already peaked. 
the question though is does inflation come down meaningfully from these levels i mean the fed wants in, inflation back at two percent it just seems like a pipe dream now I, I don't know whether you agree with that i mean are you in the camp that that they can get inflation back down to two percent through rate hikes or do you feel that that inflation is now structurally at a higher level for for years to come yeah, I mean, I hope that they're right. I mean, I, I hope that they can. <laughs> they get haven't been right on much in the in the past. They got the transitory bet very wrong. So yeah. I don't know whether they'll be right on this one either. But sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of variables. Um, you know, my feeling is that, like you said, inflation is probably peaked at this point, but that we're set for structurally higher inflation. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we're closer to three or, or 4%, um, instead of that two, you know, I think, I just think too much has changed, um, you know, to get back to that sub 2% rate that we were, were five years ago. Um, you know, I think some of the issues we've got now are, are still transitory <laughs> to use that word. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's hard to say how many of those actually go away. Um, you know, just thinking about how much the world has changed, starting with the most obvious is, is COVID happened. Um, you know, here in the U.S., everything's shut down. You have the largest fiscal stimulus in the in the history of, of the U.S., the largest monetary stimulus ever. Um, so obviously that spurs this huge increase in demand, um, but it's happening at the same time that you've shut down all of production capacity. So yeah. huge supply-demand mismatch. Um you know, some of those supply chains are starting to get repaired, but, you know, you still got pent up savings that, that we're trying to work through, um, you know, and, you know, globally supply chains are still a problem. You've got China that shuts down a, a new city every week, it seems like. Um, mm. So we don't know how long they're going to stick to, to COVID zero. And so that will have, you know, effects on supply chains for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, you've got, you still got people trying to catch up on inventories. You know, manufacturers can't get the parts that they need. Um, you've got labor shortages, uh, energy shortages, of course. Um, so all these problems, uh, you know, the other thing, you know, just outside of COVID is you've got this big trend towards deglobalization, which I think is, is a big theme. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for the last 20 years or, or more, you saw or you saw supply chains go global. Um, you know, get really just way more efficient. Uh, you find the lowest place to to produce a product and and the cheapest means of, of shipping all that good stuff. And and now, and it really started, you know, five or six years ago, um, where we started to move in the opposite direction. Uh, you can point to you know the UK leaving the European Union. Um, you know, in the U.S., we had trade wars with with Mexico and Canada, and then obviously a much bigger one with China. Um, and now you've got all these big pushes to to get productions and get supply chains more localized. Um, you know, obviously there's pros and cons of that. I don't want to get into you know which one's the right way to go, but you know, it's it's clearly less efficient. You know, if it was more efficient, that that's how things would have been in the first place. Um, so, you know, as, as produ productivity starts to decline, you know, that's, that's going to be a tailwind for inflation. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, you've also got a big shift in labor just demographically. Um, you know, you've got all these people that retired because of COVID, um, and we don't know if or when those people come back to the workforce. Uh, and then, you know, I, I believe you're working at home now. So, yep. you know, so many people are working from home and we really don't know how that will affect productivity long term. Um, you know, we just don't have the data. So, you know, that could be a headwind or a tailwind to inflation. We just don't know. Um, and then, you know, you get past all that. And then there's also the if we are going into a recession next year, how do all of these trends change? You know, recessions have a tendency to, to shift expectations and, and to shift um, just big trends in, in the economy. So, 
maybe some of these things reverse. Uh, we, the world could look very different 12 months from now than it does now. But, mm. you know, the weight of the evidence seems to suggest, you know, structurally higher inflation. Um, you know, the Fed is definitely committed to to pushing rates higher um, in an effort to get inflation low. Um, for them, their target is 2%. So it seems like they're going to keep rates high until they get there. Mm. Yeah, well, I guess we'll see. 2023 certainly has the potential to still throw up plenty of volatility given given this backdrop, because like you said, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of cross currents that we continue to grapple with as we head into the into the next year. Yeah. Uh, out, of, out of every bear market, though, emerges some great uh, long-term opportunities to build wealth for, for the medium to longer term. And I guess selfishly, that's something that I'm quite excited about, having not been invested in the market at all this year, just short-term trading uh, around some movements, but largely being sitting in cash, um, waiting for for potentially some great opportunities to to get involved. Coming out of this bear market, I guess we've got to start to identify some sort of themes, things to look out for, where we want to be starting to put our money to work for this next potential bull market cycle, whenever that may be. Have you got a shopping list ready of areas? And I know you can't be stock specific because of your your place of work and your, your you know compliance restrictions, et cetera. So I'm not asking you to pick stocks, but thematically, have you got your eye on some bigger picture themes that you'd want to be focusing on on the other side of this bear market? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, like you said, there's there's opportunities out there, um, and definitely some exciting themes. And yeah, do you have to be careful with themes that you don't fall in love with them too much? I mean, you never want to get too married to an idea because then you know if the world changes, you have trouble changing your mind. But mm. you know, themes, thematic investing definitely gives you some a great grounds for for idea generation and. Uh, justification of things so you know one we've already talked about um with deglobalization um and productivity i think the people that can find ways to to be more productive more efficient um you know those are places to look at um you know look at like automation um uh, you know technology transition being able to leverage big data and ai um yeah i think the people that can figure out how to manage that stuff those people are going to run the world. Um, you know, another one is, you know, along the same lines with just onshoring of those global supply chains. Um, just here in the U S you've got a huge infrastructure bill that was passed, um, here recently. And then, you know, the chips act just over the summer, um, you know, those are big, big spending projects and, you know, trying to get manufacturing activities onshore here in the U S. Um, so it, really just follow the money, follow the, the fiscal spending, seem like good opportunities there. Um, you know, housing, I think, is an interesting opportunity. Um, you know, I'm not sure where that opportunity lies necessarily, but, you know, you've got a huge affordability problem with mortgage rates being, you know, so much higher than they were at the beginning of the year. But at the same time, just here in the U.S., you've got a huge structural shortage of single family homes. Um, we've underbuilt single family homes for the last decade since the financial crisis. So, you know, when you've got that conflict of affordability and, and supply shortage, um, you know, there's opportunity there. Um, you know, demographically, big tailwind with uh, an aging population um, to healthcare. So that's always an opportunity, too. So. Yeah, you know, there's always always good themes in the market and, and definitely something that uh, we keep an eye on and we're looking for opportunities. Okay. Those are really interesting themes. Thank you. I mean, it's, and, and it makes a hell of a lot of sense what you're saying. We're drawing towards the end of our uh, allotted time here, Austin. So I, I'd just like to, well, A, thank you very much for your time, but B, yeah. uh, ask you, how do the viewers or listeners to this podcast follow your work? I mean, I've mentioned means to a trend.com and the, the, the daily chart report emails that come out and they're free. So obviously there's that anywhere else you on Twitter. Yeah. So I'm on Twitter. You can find me at means to a trend, um, all one word there. Um, you know, like you said, you can find me on my website means to a trend.com. Um, you can enter your email there and get all of my 
my weekly posts um, sent to your email for free. And then, uh, you know, if you want to check out some of the newer stuff I'm doing, um, check out grindstoneintelligence.com. Also all on all one word. Uh, you know, we've got some really exciting things coming there, hopefully uh, by year end. But right now publishing a weekly one pager to help people get prepared for, for the week ahead. And then, uh, you know, mid month market update that's coming out there also. Um, so again, you can enter your email and, uh, and get those for free sent directly to you. So that's fantastic. Awesome. I'm going to do that. I mean, I, I, I already follow your blog, but I wasn't aware of your, the latter one that you're doing. What did you say? It's called grind yeah. grindstone intelligence. Um, you know, I can, I can send that to you and, and maybe yeah. tag it on the, on this podcast uh, yes but, definitely yeah. wonderful all right austin well thank you so much for your time i've really enjoyed speaking to you it's been very insightful uh, and i knew it would be and I, I hope we can catch up again perhaps in another year from now maybe market will be different to, without a doubt that's i guess yeah, the one the one different. thing we can guarantee that nothing stays the same in these games in, in this game um but it's been great speaking to you and i look yeah, forward to I catching really up again the opportunity to be on so thank you for having me thank you you're listening to talking with traders a podcast series brought to you by ig a world leading online trading and investment provider if you haven't checked out the IG online trading platform, please do so and visit IG.com. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast series on your favorite podcast app or website by clicking on the subscribe button and you'll be notified weekly as we release new episodes. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking With Traders brought to you by IG, a world leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.